All righty, we'll get this started because I know we've got a couple more sessions, things to go, and then there's some beer to be had if you don't have one in your hand already. want to thank everybody for coming to this session. Appreciate you all being here. want to take a quick minute just to thank Paul Leone and his team and the board of the New York State Brewers Association for all that they do for this and allowing all of us to get back together as we're all coming out of the, uh, the weeds of the past several years. All righty, my name is Eric Coleman. I'm going to introduce the panel here in a second. We're going to get things going. This session, as you know, or may know, is creating an awesome taproom experience. So in regards to this, uh, we're going to be talking about servicing a taproom setting, creating that awesome taproom experience, and leveraging technology for your taproom. Uh, I, myself, Eric Coleman, I'm the moderator. I own Beer by Coleman, which is a craft beer concierge service. I'm based out of Western New York. I've been doing the craft beer thing for about 30 years now, being part of working with opening or operating brewing companies. I'm the director of Trocare College's Brewing Distillation Fermentation Program. And then I just help Western New York and Paul and the team do events in Western New York and around the area. Uh, before we jump into each one of these sections, I'm going to give the gentlemen a uh, chance to introduce themselves, uh, our illustrious panel here. So right to my left. Hi, I'm John Fisher. Um, I am, uh, I teach at the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, graduated from there in 1988. I've been in the restaurant business since 1984 when I was a waiter, bartender, butcher, and shucker at the Chart House in Dobbs Ferry, New York. Um, so I went, um, I left, graduated from Culinary in 88, worked in Manhattan in restaurants for about 13 years and accomplished my life goal of coming back to the CIA to teach in 2000. And since there, um, along with, I don't know if any of you have met Doug Miller, who teaches at Cornell now, uh, we created the wine and beverage management specialization at the Culinary. And as part of that, we put in a seven barrel system with the Brooklyn Brewery as our main sponsors. So we have a seven barrel system. We were actually named Brewery of the Year three years ago at the Governor's Cup because of cumulative scores. Some of you um, know of Hutch Kugeman, um, either known as brew master or the mayor. Um, anyway, he is our head brewer and uh, we teach the art and science of brewing class together. Uh, and I teach advanced wine, spirits and mixology, and we try to drag students kicking and screaming out of the kitchen and get them to come to the front of the house or do beverage. And we're usually successful. Um, so 36 years in the restaurant business, I'm trained cook, um, wine guy, Sommelier, if you want to call it that, that's a French word. I called myself a wine guy. And, um, and I'm Irish, Scottish, and German by descent, so beer runs in my veins. So there we go. Mark, on to you. Hi, my name's Mark Hewitter. I'm the owner and founder of Six Harbors Brewery, or a small microbrewery out on Long Island. Um, I got into the beer business uh, about four years ago, commercially, been home brewing for over 10. Kind of got my, uh, licked my chomps a little bit back in college. My roommate and I couldn't afford beer in college, so we bought a uh, brew kit from, uh, and I'm gonna date myself from the Sears and Robot catalog. Yeah! All right, paper so, catalog? the paper catalog yeah. that is, yes. And so, uh, no internet, no cell phones, none of that kind of stuff, so we, Kind of made a mess of the uh, resident hall kitchen. Everybody hated us because we stuck up with all the wart, but uh, we fermented in our closet in our dorm room and we would have our uh, people on our floor coming down to us every day, knocking on doors, is the beer ready yet? Like we just started fermenting yesterday and I said, it's gonna take at least 14 days. It's a quick ale. Next day, is the beer ready yet? You can't count, can you? So uh, fast forward. Um, Worked on Wall Street for 30 years uh, for an asset manager, got tired of uh, slipping into the city, uh, hour and a half each way each day, and doing a million miles on American Airlines alone. Uh, bought a building, opened up a brewery, and I lived three houses away. Next. There you go. All right, uh, my name is Jim Now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was the second brewer at the Ellicottville Brewing Company behind Finn Domenk, who was the original brewer there. Um, back when I brewed in the late 90s, early 2000s, if you made a hazy beer, if you made a sour beer, you threw it down the drain and you tried again. So I'm a little jealous of you all. Um, I currently own the Fredonia location of the Ellicottville Brewing Company, and then my day job is until Friday at 5 o'clock, because tomorrow's my last day. I'm currently the restaurant operations consultant for U.S. Foods in uh, Western New York. Awesome, Alrighty, We're gonna turn it over to Mark. You can go ahead and roll with your first section. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate it. Um, 
So, like I said, I have a small brewery out on Long Island, and um, we're a brewery with a tap room. Um, we don't distribute at all. We sell 99.9% .9 of our beer over the counter. Um, that's our business model. We do not want to get into the distribution game. So we had to figure out a way and create a vision to get our customers to come to the tap room to drink beer, come to the tap room to buy beer, come to the tap room to get a keg for a party at their house. So um, I'm gonna go through some slides. I try to kind of keep it visual so you can see you know, what we've done and make some comments of how we've done our business and we're gonna open up along the way for questions. So if there's a particular slide and you have a question, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and we'll see if we can answer it as best we can. So I wanna start out with, um, this was one of my fear factors that you know, 80% of small businesses fail within the first three years, and I did not want to become a statistic on that. I wanted to make money. So I spent three and a half years researching uh, brewery. I was in the asset management company, uh, a business for 30 years, had to write business plans all the time, so um, I got around doing that. So after writing that business plan, which was 35 pages long, uh, the financial side, it was another 15 pages long, brought it down to the Small Business Administration and asked them, what do you think? They go, this is one of the best business plans we've ever seen. Uh, we, you went down to not just the penny uh, of an ounce of beer, but how much CO2 are you gonna be using? How much uh, um, en energy are you using in your cooler? Um, I'm anal to a fault. Um, so I try to do my best. So this is building the experience. Uh, this is the building that we bought. We wanted to buy and control our own destiny and uh, find out five years down the road after our first year we're successful and all of a sudden our rent you know, triples in the amount. So we can control our, our rent and our, and our money that way. So you can see some of the build out here that we did. You know, it was very messy. Uh, but after that, you can see some pictures of what we did to the place to create a inviting, warm looking experience to come into the brewery. And the first thing that people tell us, um, or actually when they leave is like, you know, I really like this place. The first thing I walked into here is I could feel the vibe of this place. I really, really like it. So we wanted to create something that was warm, exciting and welcoming to everybody that we had in the place. So you build it and they're gonna come. Uh, we are open seven days a week. Uh, we only close for the holidays and we're busy most of the time, slows up in January and February. So people don't plan to fail. They just plan to fail, uh, fail the plan, right? So as I went back before, I wrote a 35 page business plan. I need down to exactly what I want to do, what the look of the place, the feel of the place, how I wanted people to come into the place and, and look around and see what we could do. I'm not gonna get into my MASH story, maybe I'll say that for later if we have time, but every quarter we do a SWOT analysis. For those who don't know what SWOT is, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. I did it last night with my team. We had a dinner last night, went over our staff, and besides me doing a SWOT analysis for the business, I get my team together and we do a SWOT analysis with the group because there's some things that I might know and you know, and, uh, and they know and some things I don't know, they'll bring up and they'll work for us to build our business. And this is the kind of pictures and this is kind of what we build. When you walk into our place, you get to see the fermenters. As we say, the emperor wears no clothes. We show everything of how everything is. We have people that want to walk around the counter and touch those fermenters. We actually name our fermenters each week after a TV show or a movie. So there was a guy that was walking over, he goes, hey, can I have some of the George? And I go, I'm sorry, um, that's just a name. George, John, Paul, Ringo. So that week was the Beatles. So he felt really embarrassed, but I said, guys, it happens to us all the time. So we have people that take a look at our space and they look at it, they really like it, they really enjoy it, and that we have them come back for more. So why Six Harbors? We have Six Harbors in our town. And one of the things that we do is we name a beer after each harbor. And we put a philanthropic component 
into that as well. So each of the harbor beers that we name, so our Huntington Harbor Hoppy is associated with a St. Hughes Church. We help fund their soup kitchen and after school program. So any of the beers that we can under that brand, we give money back to that charity so they can do good to the community. So all the Harbor beers, we work with, you know, the Comset Foundation, we DNA Labs for the Cold Spring Harbor Labs. So what happens with that is what you give, we get back. No deposit, no return, as I like to call it. And so we go out to the community and we give money through these programs of buying beer. And they want to come back to us, right? And it helps us increase our revenue because they want to have an event at our space. So if we went back just quickly, if you take a look at the left-hand slide, that room right there holds about 30 people, 35 people. Last year, we did over $65,000 in revenue just from the rental space from that room. And it comes from the philanthropic aspect, them coming back wanting to do their events with us to raise more money. So may the 4th be with you. We were born on May 4th. It was a Friday back in 2018. We got our CEO at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. We said to ourselves, all right, so what do we do now? We have this thing. Let's open up our doors. Let's take down the coming soon sign. Let's see what happens. Within an hour, we had 50 people in the place because we had that sign out there for 18 months. It took us 18 months to open. We went to our zoning board five times to get approval for our tap room. We had our brewery open eight months before then, but we didn't do anything until we got our tap room because our business model was solely the tap room, no distribution. So how do we create it? We built a community center. One of our running clubs came to me one night, Mark, he goes, you didn't build just a brewery, you built a community center. And that has to do with the look, the feel, the space, has to do with what versus who, or who versus what, you know, who do you want your audience to be, right? Versus what is your audience? Who's coming there now versus, has anybody really thought about your audience and what you want your audience to be at the brewery? We're dog friendly, we're kid friendly. Um, you'll see in the next slide, you know, a picture of some of our dogs. Um, there's a picture of a can inside of our canning machine. We have a single canning machine. We've canned 85,000 cans in less than four years from that one machine. We have that right on the counter and the people can choose their beer and we can make any beer for them fresh in the can right in front of them. It's part of the experience of the tap room. They pick their beer, they see us shoot CO2 into the can, we tap, put the beer into the can, put a lid on it, put it into the canning machine and can it. We have people taking their iPhones out and videotaping their beer being made in front of them and they get to see how that whole process is done. It's not done in the back, not 120 cases of beer in the cooler and you're pulling out a four pack for them. One of the things that we also do is we create a mix and match. So you can mix and match your beers right then and there and no extra cost. So if he likes the double IPA, she likes the wheat beer, you can get two beers in a four pack for the same price and we're not upcharging you. We're not making you buy two four packs. That's not our business model. We want our customers to be our beer ambassadors to take those two four packs, had a great time at our brewery, bring it at home saying, we love these beers at the brewery, we're loving it at home, sharing with our friends, you guys have to go down to the brewery with us next time. That's how we run it. Don't get a second chance at a first impression. These are the brew dogs at Six Harbors. These dogs have been in 13 different countries around the world. During the pandemic, they delivered beer, just like the old Bernese Mountain Dog with the whiskey barrel underneath their nest. They did a four pack empty, of course, around their neck. And it got picked up on CBS Saturday morning news around the country, NBC for New York, Channel 12 are local, and the 13 different countries, newspapers around the world. So um, it happened by accident and we took it to our advantage. So when I talk about you don't get a second chance at a first impression, 
we talk about our introduction. We train our staff really importantly that when people come in and we introduce them, saying, hi, how are you today, as opposed to, what can I get you? Hi, my name is Mark. I'm going to be your beer tender today. What kind of beer would you like today? If you have any questions, let us know. I'd be more than happy to explain anything that you want from them. Um, we also have you know, our elevator pitch. What's your 30-second elevator pitch to your customers? When I'm walking around the brewery and we have people, you know, slinging beer in the back, um, picking up glasses, talking to them, and, like, and they, they want to see the owner. They want to see the person making the beer. They want to talk to them say, hey, guess what? I talked to the owner last night. I talked to the guy who makes, makes, makes the beer at the place. They feel important. So we find it very important for not just myself, but the rest of our peer tenders to get out from behind the counter, picking up glasses and talking to our customers about our brewery. We also, from that standpoint, we also upsell them in terms of, would you like another beer? I see your glass is empty, I'm picking it, would you like another beer? What do you mean, you, you'll actually go and get me another beer? Most breweries, you gotta go to the counter, get your beer and you go sit down. You know, most of them don't have table service. We don't have a table service, but we walk around and kind of do that little extra concierge service that you want there. We also will go out and pour, give you 13 different splashes of a beer. So if you're not sure what kind of beer that you want, we'll sit there and we'll give you a splash of every beer that's on that top. We won't limit you to three or four because we want to make sure that you get the right beer in your glass and you thought that beer was something, but you weren't sure, and you got a pint of it, and you're not happy with it, now you got to nurse it. You're not happy, I'm not happy. Because a lot of times, I see that you're not happy, I take that beer, and I just pour it right down the drain. Right? Because I'm going to give them a new beer, because I want them to have a great experience there. And then, what we do besides that, talked about the floating counter service, but also, you know, how is everything when they're leaving? How is your experience? What can we do to improve it? Talked about the dogs, dog friendly, right? Uh, bands versus acoustic. What's the vibe that you want to have at your brewery? We're more acoustic. We tried bands, it was a disaster. Didn't work, it changed the complete vibe of our brewery. It just wasn't our style. Bands might work for you, just didn't work for us. You try it, see what happens to yourself. Event planning, talked about that, raised over $60,000 doing events just inside our little space. 2,500 square feet. We do about, uh, about 1,000 barrels a year. And the social nights. Social nights are really important for those slow Monday and Tuesdays. So trivia night, um, um, trivia, bingo, that kind of stuff. So kind of in ending, it kind of takes a village, right? So once you come into our brewery, you'll see the hop plants in the springtime. We grow hops right on our property. Not a lot, just only 15 plants, only enough to make about, you know, you have a 10 barrel system, one 10 barrel system, we use the hops, but people like it. They actually go over there, they pull the hops off, they smell them, you know, they, they think it's really, really cool. Once again, the experience. We have our brew dogs, Buddy, Barley, and Brandy, the triple Bs, they're down there all the time. People love it, they, they hang out with our dogs, they, other dogs hang out with them, um, and they just enjoy just being down there just like our, our customers do. So in, in ending, it takes a village. So we work with a lot of communities within our place. We do our Chamber of Commerce, the YMCA, the hospitals, the schools, bring it all together in terms of somebody comes into my brewery, and they need a growler and a uh, gift card for something, we're gonna do it. We don't turn anybody down because it comes back to us in space because they'll come back. And we did last spring, a 150 person uh, event for the 50th re reunion of the local high school. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I know I talked a lot about a lot of stuff out there, but the thing is, what kind of vibe do you wanna create your brewery. Thank you. Got time for just a couple quick questions before we move on and then we'll have some time at the end for you know a little more Q&A. Just want to make sure we get time for everybody. Anybody have any questions at the moment for Mark? Uh, can you just 
flip four pack. Do you ever find that there's like one beer that maybe people don't get and it's like you left over with a bunch of singles of something and you got to try and sell those as well? No, no, because we make every beer fresh right from the tap. Yes. Sometimes we do. With, with, if it's a big event, if it's more than 60 people, we'll close the tap room. We charge an event fee and a per head fee. Um, and if it's warm outside, we have a uh, outdoor urban beer garden. And we'll talk technology uh, in the next session where people will uh, be able to use um, our technology to order a beer and not have to go inside to disrupt the crowd. Yeah, I would add on that. If you have a, a sophisticated enough POS system, you can look at how much business you did on that day and whether you're doing it through event fees or whether you're charging a minimum for that event. You know, my, my rule of thumb is if I can do what I typically would do in that time period with that space, I'm doing it now for an event in a few weeks. I just looked at the upstairs, said, OK, I did two grand upstairs. I'm going to get 2200 for this party on that night. I'd much rather execute an event. It's a lot easier to execute in my mind, especially if you have food involved. So make sure you're not taking an event that's going to hurt your overall revenue. Make sure that it's going to at least be a wash. And then you, you get known for those events. But you got to kind of do it on a case by case basis to make sure you're not hurting yourself. All right, we can get time for one more. Awesome. Getting, getting, you know, getting back to your question real quick is that we, uh, or back behind you, is um, we, we have a, our system allows our customers when we have a private event inside to sit at our picnic tables, they can pull up the uh, a tab on their phone, they can order the beer, they can look at our menu on the phone, they can order the beer from our phone, we'll have a server come out and deliver them the beer, and when they're done, they can close their tab out on their phone and walk out. Where are you using for this? Excuse me? Where are you using for this? It's called Arrived. I guess we're, we're kind of having that kind of um, dilemma as well that you shut down the entire tap room for a large event. So shutting off our normal custom for a private event, whether it's worth it or not. Well, we, you know, we, we, we struggle with that too in terms of do we want to piss off our local customers because we're closed. So we, we give advance notice of when we're having those events. Um, winter kind of sucks because you really we have a tent outside which is heated we we pump in heat we have music try to make it but the it's kind of not the same but we'll get 60 people in the tent in December and it's 12 degrees outside if we have a private event inside awesome well, last question and then we're gonna move on just so we can get to the flow goes go right ahead sir yeah, hi. Uh You know, in our mind, it's a loss leader. It is. It, it's a, just another thing that we bring to the brewery. Um, we generally don't lose money on it it's just because of the nights that we do it. We have good crowds. Um, but uh, it's just a, another thing that's happening at the brewery, you know, besides, you know, trivia or bingo or something like that. We got live music. I think you also have to analyze and bake in those, uh, you know, BMI and all the other costs. You have to look at that as a cost of having a live music program. There are solutions if you're not doing live music, obviously, that, that maybe are a little more cost efficient. 
But if you are doing live, live music, you have to build in that cost besides paying that band. Hey, what, what is my cost for doing this? And then look at what's the additional gross profit. Look at a night when you have a band on a typical night versus you don't. Have you created more revenue and has that additional gross profit paid for the cost of covering that band? It's, it's a little bit of math, but if you do it right, you can realize, or you can treat it as a loss leader too. I personally didn't treat it as a loss leader. We did it to try to see if we could make more money. But in some instances, you're, you're marketing and you're branding and you're, you're using that band to get people to come back on a different night. So really very <clears throat> Awesome. All right. We're going to hold off on the questions just for a moment, move on to the next one, give everybody just the chance, and then there'll be a little bit of time at the end to make sure we get to, because I know there are a couple more hands up there. All righty. Next up. Service. Okay. Okay. So um, actually, rather than, rather than starting with this, I wanted to mention something that we don't often think about in our business or even in the restaurant business, a related business, which is... A show of hands, how many of you opened a brewing business because you love beer and you like brewing? Leave your hands up if you checked to see if the area needed a brewery. <laughs> okay. Um, in our businesses, breweries and restaurants, very rarely do we think about the customer first. Because if they don't want what you have, you're not going to make any money. And uh, the, you know, the fact that Hazy IPA is in every, almost every brewery in the state now is because people like it. At, we judged at the Governor's Cup, mm -hmm. and we judged a lot of Hazy IPAs. <laughs> And but if you all tasted the same, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them did. They were all delicious. <laughs> They're great, but <laughs> but they all tasted the same. But they sell, and there's a saying in the bar business, which is vodka pays the bills. Find a craft bartender who wants to make vodka cocktails, and I'll tell you that's a crazy bartender. They want to make cocktails with gin, but gin is five percent of national sales of spirits. Anyway, are you selling? Are you? Is your market? Are you giving them what they want? And positioning is finding your market, finding out what they want, and then delivering it. It might not be what you want to make or what you want to sell or what you want to sell, but it's what's going to make money. And then somewhere along the way, you have to make a decision, professional slash personal decision, as to am I willing to sell vodka? Am I willing? There are, bar, there, there are cocktail bars in the city that ban vodka. And that's one of the dumbest things you could do when you want to make money. Now, I was a young, stupid restaurant manager. I was like, ah, absolute vodka sucks. I'll take it off the bar. And I did. And cocktail sales went down. So I put it back. And one time I took Kendall Jackson Chardonnay off the list because I didn't drink it. I didn't like it myself. And wine sales went down. So we have to think about what you have to go by what your, what your market wants if you want to make money. So on to the uh, presentation, though, and I promise not to take a lot of time. Um, service hardware, the, 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 the physical things that you build to give service. Um, decor, as you mentioned, decor is the first impression. People walk into your place, and that is what they see. And it includes cleanliness. It includes cigarette butts in, this, in the gutter outside. It includes your parking lot with potholes and lights that don't work. Um, decor is the first impression, and as you said, you only have the chance to make one first impression. Luckily, we have a chance to make a second impression, impression a little bit later, but that decor and organization of the place when they walk in. Where's the front door? How many times have you walked up to a store or a restaurant and pulled on a door and it was locked and it pissed you off and you didn't exactly feel like staying there because the door was locked? And then the, you see the little tiny sign that says entrance around corner. I mean, why the hell do people do that? Just block off that door, put you know caution tape on it or something. <laughs> but organization and decor are the first impression. Then clear information. When they walk in, do they know where to go to get their beer? Again, put yourself in the situation of a guest, because you are a guest when you go to other places. Do you know when you walk in where to order your beer? Do you know where to order your food? We went to a place in Rochester where you ordered the beer from the bar, but the food from the kitchen. 
and they were in completely different parts of the, of the, of the brew pub. That doesn't make sense. And yeah, there's a learning curve, just like at our, on our campus. We have a student dining area that's open to the public, and some stuff you get from the stations, some you get from a kiosk. So it's a very steep but very short learning curve, but it's a learning curve nonetheless. A learning curve is an obstacle, and it keeps people from ordering stuff and drinking more. So menu ordering procedures, um, I know that you know those of us around my age in this room, I'm 62, um, some people have problems with QR codes. I do not. I know how to work a QR code and I know how to order from my phone. But some people don't, and even some young non-tech people don't know. So be aware of the fact, and you're gonna be talking about tech, um, be aware of how easy or difficult you make it for people to order food and or, or beer. And as I just said, ease of ordering and efficiency. Um, there's a taco restaurant near us down in um, Newburgh called Hudson Taco. And the ordering is simple as can be. You have these paper menus on your table, you check off what you want, you hand it to the waiter, and the food comes out really quickly. Beers are on there, everything, you just fill it out with a pencil. Ordering is as simple as can be. You don't even have to be told by the waiter what to do because the pencils and these menus to fill out are right there. You can figure it out and you don't have, well, actually now their menus are on a QR code, um, but still it's pretty easy to figure out. So I, how easy- If I could add one thing on that too, technology can work both ways. It can make that process simple, but I have seen technology used where it makes the ordering process that much more oh, difficult. Evil. evil, evil technology. Too many options <laughs> and everything else like that. So just keep in mind, it's it, he's not necessarily talking about the vehicle to do it, because I mean, paper is a technology, right? We didn't have it at some yeah. point in time. And it's just a, analog. Yeah, exactly. It's an analog. You know, a very effective paper process that works for your system, but it, you could have a very ineffective, high-tech system that just makes the oh, customer- impenetrable. Yeah, exactly. So keep that in mind when you're- um, Service speed and accuracy. Um, that's, to a certain degree, um, training, uh, but it's also systems. And having a system like they have at Hudson Taco, where the food just flies out of that kitchen, that's all system-based. Who's pouring your beers? Um, there is a um, brewery that shall not be named um, in the Hudson Valley. And when they built their bar, they built it with about a 10, 12 foot space from the bar to the back wall where the taps are. That's a long walk. The bartenders have to pack a light lunch before they go to get your beer. And I told them when they built this, I said, you have to move that bar. The optimal space behind a bar is three feet. Three feet is one step to the back bar and one step back. You change that to four feet, it's now two steps. You now have doubled the trip that the bartender has to make by adding only one foot to the width of the bar, to the distance from the front, from the well to the, to the back wall. Add five feet, six feet, 10 feet. You're like, do, 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 watching your bartender walk off into the mist as they're going to get your beer. And eventually they make it back. Hair's grown in, the beard's grown in. It, you know, it's a woman, she's now half pregnant. You know, it, it just, it, the design of the bar makes a difference as well with regard to the speed of the service, as well as, as the training of your staff. And when people want to leave, they want to leave. You know this as well as I do. You could be sitting at that damn table for three hours with someone you haven't seen in 20 years, but when you wanna go, a red light starts flashing in the back of your head and there's a bell ringing. It's a loud bell and you want to go. You want to pay and you want to leave that second. So making it easy for people to pay and get out of there. And as you said, uh, you said people can pay their tab on, on, the, on their, their electronic, um, electronic bill. That's brilliant, be able to let someone get out of there and also giving them an opportunity to tip well on it. Um, even if they didn't see their waiter that much, they'll see that tip line and they'll fill something in. But make it easy for people to pay, make it easy, easy for them to order, make it easy for them to leave. So speed and tipping are both things that you wanna make easy for your guests. Now, the hug part, the software. There's an old saying in the restaurant business, the front of your restaurant tells people to either come and stay or stay away. 
you made them want to come and stay. You had that sign that said opening soon, and as you've said, you've designed a place that makes people feel welcome when they come in. Um, either it's a door on the corner of the building or whatever it is, making people, making it easier for them to, for them to come in and making them, uh, making them feel welcome when they come in. Danny Meyer is a very famous restaurant tour that I've known him for decades. And he is as nice and warm as you might imagine, considering his company. And you feel like you're getting a hug, even though they don't touch you when you walk into the front of his restaurants. And people like hugs. They like verbal hugs, they like visual hugs. Um, Welcome Back is something I started at an Italian restaurant um, called Campania. Um, it was a really busy, very good Italian restaurant on 23rd Street, Manhattan. And I told my entire front of the house staff, if you recognize a customer, there's this whole Ritz Carlton thing about addressing people by name, that's great. But if you have hundreds of people coming in a day, you're not necess necessarily gonna remember their names. But if you recognize them as having been there before, say welcome back. Don't worry about the name, just say welcome back. Excuse me, welcome back. Because don't you like that when you walk into a restaurant or a bar or whatever, and they say welcome back or they recognize you and say, hey, it's been a while. That makes that person feel good. What did Dale Carnegie say? The most beautiful sound you'll ever hear is the sound of your, your own name. Well, forget the name, just say welcome back to people you recognize. Um, inclusion and comfort, making people feel comfortable, as you said. Make sure they want to physically stay there for another beer. Now, of course, technically, food makes them stay for the third or fourth. Um, and that's a whole different story. We could spend a whole thing on restaurant operations. But making it a place where they want to stay, whether it's petting the dog, or having a conversation with the bartender who is knowledgeable about the beer, make them feel welcome, make them feel like they want to stay there. And of course, food. Um, it doesn't have to be a full kitchen. It can be a pizza oven. I know there are like portable pizza ovens upstairs. Um, microwave, there's microwavable food that's decent these days. Um, or just a damn toaster oven. You, you, just something more than a bag of pretzels will get people to stay. This ain't Utah. You don't have to legally serve food with beer. Um, so food, a way to get people to stay. And the overarching, and yeah, it sounds like a Hallmark card, but will they leave happier than when they walked in? Not necessarily because they're half in the bag, but because you made them feel good, because you gave them a delicious beer, you gave them the kind of beer that they want to drink, whether it's a hazy IPA or not. It probably is. Um, but will they come back to you because of the way you made them feel? Not how good the beer was. Because there can be beer that is, there are breweries and brew pubs around us in the Hudson Valley where the beer is not necessarily the most exciting beer on the planet. But people love those restaurants. They love those tap rooms because of the way they make them feel. So that's it from me. Hey, Eric, before you uh, answer, ask for questions, you know, I, I think it's also really important to look at your customer base and figure out, you know, what is good service to them. Because, I mean, it, it baffles me, but there is a younger generation where good service to them is information at their fingertips, speed, and accuracy of what they're ordering, and maybe they don't want to interact with uh, another human being. But there is a huge, and especially in the brewing industry, a huge contingent that exactly what you talked about was they want, they want the personal touch and experience and everything along those lines. So I think it's very important for you to figure out which is, what is your model, what is your vision? You know, Mark had a real good vision. Mark's vision kind of takes into account a little bit of both of those, right? He can, he can give that experience when they come into the room and he can greet them and everything else like that. But he also gives those folks the ability to, to pay when they want to go or not to interact with the system. So really thinking about what that means for you and for your brand and for your restaurant, I think is, is really important. The story. Yep. They want the story. And boomers want consistency and they want the same beer every time. So you might have to keep some beers on your menu to keep some of your older customers happy. And I just, have, just found out that I'm technically not a boomer. There's a, actually, apparently, it's Generation Joe <laughs> that I heard. It's younger, younger so-called boomers. Um, but you know, offering tastings and flights and having a description of each beer for the, for the millennials and Gen X and Z, X, Y, and Z, and for the boomers, 
you better keep that favorite number one seller on that menu for them. And they want to see the same, see the same bartender every time too. And they want to see it sit at the same table and they want to pet the same dog and they don't want any changes. Um, and, but who is your main clientele, as you said? It's funny he says that, right? So um, I have a huge demographic of customers because I have the grandparents, the parents, the kids, and the dogs come in Sunday sitting around the table and they want that table. Um, and then I'll get the, uh, the young ones. You know, I'm an FOG and there's about, like, you know, FNGs, you know, at the place. So they want the technology. They want to be able to sit at the picnic table. They want to be able to take a look at the menu on their phone open up a tab, then go up to the counter, and we see that Joe opened up a tab, we're getting your blueberry wheats, and you're sitting back down, where the other gentleman who, like me, has to put his glasses on and still can't read the computer, takes a look at the big <laughs> type that we have for the beers and wants to know a little bit more. He wants to hear the human element touch about the beers and maybe taste them, and it's not a hazy double IPA, it's a blueberry wheat. Awesome. What we're going to do, just because of time and we don't want to hold anybody up, I'm just going to hold off on questions for the moment. We're going to have Jim step up and go through his portion of the presentation, and that should leave us a little bit of time at the end. I know we are the last session, so uh, we can stick around for a few minutes more to help answer any questions that uh, you, you have if we didn't get to you. But with that being said, go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Eric. So I, I kind of broke it out into to three main sections. The first is your, your online presence, your digital presence. And uh, I've done a lot of this with not only breweries, but also with other restaurants that I work with at U.S. Foods and, and take this advice myself. I really think Google is more important than your website right now. You can go on Google and you can order food without ever going to your website. You can make a reservation without ever going to your website. You can actually call the restaurant, message, whatever, without ever going to the restaurant. You need to look at your Google presence, claim your Google My Business, do the things that produce you higher to the time. I'm not saying you should spend money on Google Ads. That is a strategy. There might be some time where there's a good opportunity to spend that money. But in a lot of ways, Google can be more important than your website. Google will let you build a free basic website if you don't really want to buy a website. Having said that, the website's probably the most second most important thing, and that's monetizing that website. Monetizing for Brewery A, maybe trying to get them to order online, and so or order swag or something else like that. And so you have to stumble over everything else to not do that thing that monetizes that website. Brewery B may want it to be more about branding. Brewery C may have a, a nice food component, and they want to get people to, to make a reservation and come in and eat at the restaurant. So whatever that is, that's your digital front door. It's more important than the sign on your building, without a doubt, because that's how a lot of people are going to find out about you. So making sure you have a good website, making sure you're monetizing it, making sure it's mobily optimized, more than half of all searches. Actually, it's probably closer to 75% these days. I don't know the statistics happen on a mobile device. Don't forget your review sites. I'm, I'm not a Yelp, nobody from Yelp is here. I'm not a huge Yelp fan, but I claim Yelp, and I respond to the reviews. I will not give them any money or anything else like that, but Yelp, Untapped, Google, Facebook, uh, all of these. TripAdvisor is a great one, too. People love to drink craft beer when they're traveling. I craft beer vacation all the time. So make sure you're claiming those, making sure you're taking advantage of those. Make sure even if it's just a simple response, on a positive review and a, hey, sorry we didn't give you the opportunity or the, the, the experience that you wanted on a negative review and then give some information, let that customer reach back out to you. It's really important to manage those reviews. Um, I don't know a lot about Untapped. I know it's really important. I know there's different levels and know you as brewers have access to managing your beers and everything else like that, but you may want to look at Untapped for business as well. But your digital online presence is huge. I don't spend, but except for one travel guide, I spend nothing on print, radio, television at all. We put all of our time and effort and money into our digital online presence. As far as in the restaurant, there's digital tools. We talked about it, a, a good POS system. I'm a firm, I don't, I'm, I'm POS agnostic. Use whichever one works best for you. But your POS, if you're a sit down dining type restaurant, you got to have handhelds. Just the number of steps that your servers take every night to go to the table. Think about if you're going to cash out with a credit card. Server walks to the table, says, uh, and I'd like to cash out. Okay, let me get your bill. You walk back to the station, print the bill. You walk back, the person gives you a credit card. You walk back. You print the credit card receipt, you walk back, 
get the credit card receipt signed, you walk back to the store. How many steps is that? Instead of if you have a handheld, your bill is going to be uh, $46, you hand them the handheld. And some people don't want to give up their credit cards now. Exactly, exactly. I mean, the, the number of steps in the efficiency of your server just to be able to do that, that, that transaction at the table. There's some coaching. I talked to someone today about you can't give someone a handheld to pay for a bill and then hover over them. They're going to be like, well, is this person looking to see how much tip I'm going to give them, or what did I do? Uh, you, you need to make sure that, that you're, you're, you're trained properly on it and work with the customer on it. And there's going to be some customers that want paper, but having the ability to have a POS system that allows you to do that, uh, that transaction at the table is going to be really important. Things like online ordering in your POS system, things like QR codes, your service model. Mark talked about it. I, I don't think there's one service model anymore. I don't think it's full service anymore. It's, it's a hybrid service. You've got to have let people pay at the table if they want. There's a model. Uh, Eric and I are going to open a place in Williamsville. The model is going to be kind of a spread of all of this. If you want to come in and not talk to anyone, get your food and get your beer, you're going to be able to do that. If you have, are you a little bit older, you know, or you're just with a group where you want to have that service, we'll send a server, but we're sending a server to the table with a handheld because it's going to speed things up. So no, that POS systems can have the biggest impact on efficiency and labor and, and profitability in a restaurant without that. Um, third party delivery, I do 25% of the business at my EBC location. It's granted it's in a college town in Fredonia, New York online orders and third party delivery systems just implemented DoorDash. I've been preaching to everyone else to do it. I did not do it myself. I've done it about a month ago. I am shocked at the amount of volume that we do. Um, we charge a lot of extra money on that because DoorDash takes a huge chunk, but the consumer is willing. They pay that extra amount and then they pay $6 delivery fee on top of that. So, so they're looking at that menu. They're exactly. Looking at your retail menu. Exactly. So it, it's 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 a different generation. I know what generation is ordering that, but it's amazing how much business you can do. You can deliver alcohol, uh, sealed beer on DoorDash. You, you have to pay a certain rate and everything else like that, but it is perfectly legal. I'm not the legal expert on that. Um, staff management tools to help you manage both your brewery staff, your front of the house staff, switching shifts. Think of it as like labor and scheduling and everything else like that. They're great communication tools. They're really important, I think, to run a, a tap room along those lines. If you are at a bigger tap room, I know uh, a couple of friends here from some Western New York breweries that do a tremendous amount of sit-down dining service, and you decide to do reservations, reservations is a choice. Some places do them, some places don't. But if you're going to do reservations and you don't have a reservation system to both manage them coming in and then manage the reservations when they're in there, it, it's, it's just it's, it's huge. And then I know all you brewers and owners do a cost analysis on your brewing and your batches and how much raw ingredients and what, what's my profit and how much does it cost cost me, cost of goods and everything else like that. There are tools to do specifically that in high volume restaurants. I really suggest taking a look at those. There's not enough time to go into those. Um, and then, you know, the last component before we, I think we go to questions is, is marketing. And I actually put Facebook in there, but it's also email campaigns and it's text campaigns. I mean, there are a lot of tools, tools that help you schedule your social media. I know we did some webinar, sorry, some seminars earlier about, you know, doing great uh, photography and, and social media and marketing on a budget. The, these tools that allow you to set up a schedule and produce it across multiple platforms, including Google. Do not forget, you can post on Google. You post on Google, people see you on Google, that increases your Google ranking. Um, but, but getting these tools that help you do this, to help you get campaigns, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to reach more people? Are you trying to get you know, more retention with the, with the folks that you have on Facebook? But whether it's social media or email, if you have a good PO, most of these good cloud-based POS systems that I talked about earlier is helping your, your operation. Most of these are gathering email addresses. They're gathering text messages. Because you took that information within a transaction uh, with a customer, you are legally able to solicit them with that information that they give you. And you, if you solicit them with that information that you give, you give you through like an email campaign or a text campaign, you have to figure out what's right for you. But that data, Google gathers all, we all see it in the news, Google gathers all that data. Facebook gathers all that data. Guess what? You should have access to that data. Those are your customers. And then you can market to them to do like things Mark said with events, right? That's a great way to say, hey, we're going to do a fundraiser. Imagine 
taking that email address that you got from your cloud-based POS system, putting it together with a beer that Mark brewed, doing it at an event that gives charity back to the community, and doing that service model where some people are going to come up and want to taste and touch, and other people are just going to come in, scan that QR code, drink some beer. Some of these POS systems, you can put a um, charity tip right in the system as they're checking out. And so, you know, there is really an ability to do a lot of amazing things with all of what these guys said. So I'm going to leave it there with that, the technology piece, and I think we should just open it up to questions. Sounds good. Yep, we got time. I know we're wrapping it up and nearing some of the other stuff, but we can go ahead and take questions for any one of the gentlemen up here. I know there were a couple that had it. I have a question just uh, regarding the uh, technology that you're thinking of integrating uh, for, for new generations that, uh, that may prefer to not have interpersonal communication with their sure. server. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect the servers and bartenders' bottom line as far as, well, this person only, you know, they only brought me drinks, they didn't do much to upsell. Is there some sort of guarantee for the server's wages that, that you're going to do to, to leverage their experience on, on a daily basis and, and to make them feel more comfortable about, you know, am I going to make it? As much money as I, as I sure, make it. sure. That's a great question. You cannot leave out how this impacts your staff. So a few things. Technology, those handhelds allow a server to have a six-table section instead of a four-table section because they're not having to go back and forth as much. So they'll sell more uh, sales, and at the same tip level, they'll make more tips, they'll make more money, they'll stay longer, and everything else like that. It's also things like these, these technologies have programmable tip amounts. And if you put 16, 18, and 20% tip, your servers are gonna get something on average, but if you put 18, 20, and 22, I guarantee you, your servers are gonna make more tips on average. So you need to think about what you're presenting. I did that in my restaurant. I am also a consultant. I stepped away from my restaurant for months and had really good managers, but somewhere along the line, we lowered the lowest tip percentage. That lowered the overall tips that we were seeing in our restaurant. And it was just a simple going into the, the back end of the POS and changing that so that they're making more tips. And it was, it, you know, you have to be cognizant of that. I do agree with what you're saying. Sometimes the limited service model, even myself as a tipper, I might feel like, hey, I'm not going to uh, tip as much as a percentage. But also, these technologies should be increasing the amount of sales and, and the, the number of people that are needed to do this. Less tip outs, less servers, less employees, same amount of business, maybe more business. You know, would you rather have 10% tip on, uh, on $2,000, you're making $200, or would you rather have a 16% on, on, you know, $1,000 or something like that. You have to take that into consideration. You have to communicate that to your employees. That's very important. These technologies also allow for a lot of cross-tipping and things along those lines. And to help, very good to point. piggyback on that, just to help mitigate some of those potential worries that your staff might have, and I know both of the, everybody here has kind of alluded to it, that comes down to that training, making sure you're providing that top-level ultimate service you can to every customer that walks through. So yeah, maybe they want that touchless, and that's what they want, but as Mark said, they're going around and collecting glasses. Uh, Cross-train your staff. The, the days of bartenders, servers, busters, and everything else, the, COVID, if not anything, showed us with the labor shortage, you should be cross-training everybody. Yeah, you might have people who are better at bartending than serving, but they should know what they're doing because the more people that can interact with your customers, depending, no matter where they're at, they can go out and bust that table, check in with them, maybe set that all set, but that customer will remember. It's like there were people checking in with us as opposed to Ghost Town where that interaction may or may not but every chance you have to have a touch at that table and you know just checking in to make sure everything's good or making sure there weren't any problems that they can address before they leave the building because as we all know you get a thousand great awesome comments and then you get one yelp you are like climbing over a wall to try to catch that customer before they get out the door and it could have been something that could have been mitigated had somebody just picked up a glass from the table to check in. So that's also another way to help make sure your staff feels secure, but still delivering the service the way the customer or the client wants it. And, and a busser saying, oh, do you want another beer? Instead of the waiter having to go over to the table. Yeah. You, you need to make a, a, a model that is, you know, I, Mark will say this as an owner himself too, you need to have a model where it's not only a win for the ownership and the, and the business, but it's also a win for the employees. If their servers are inherently um, uh, incented to do more because the more they sell, the more money they make, you need to have that, that idea that everyone's in this together and we're all, you know, 
you have to have that. That's just going to lead to great employee retention, too. Yeah. So. And you can change. Yeah. We, it's not we, set in stone. We had that issue, too, in addressing your question before in terms of our bartenders. We moved from one POS system, which was just, just kicking out yards of paper. You know, you had a receipt, you know, and the customer didn't want the receipt, but they had a sign for the receipt. And we moved to sign on screen and like, oh, they're not going to tip as much. You know, they, they, got work. they tip 20 percent more. Our tips ease, went up as well. Ease of service. The guys who are using their phone to open up a tab and close the tab, right? You don't think that's service? That's service, right? Because they are doing it on their time. They like it. They move at their speed. You don't have the waiter or waitress coming over three times. You ready to order yet? You ready to order? Nah, I can order whenever I want. I open up my tab, take a look at it, order the beer, and then I can walk up to the counter and get it at my speed. I like that. I'm going to tip more. Got time for just a couple more questions. Anyone else? Yes. No, we're, we're, we're around the floor, so, you know, the, uh, if the, they go on their phone and they, uh, they place an order, you know, we'll get a you know, pop up on our screen at the, the counter, right? The, or in some cases, if we're outside, a ticket will kick up on the receipt, the beer tender will take it, get the order set up, and bring it over to the side counter. The person that's outside that's running around doing, you know, 20 different things will come back inside, see that, take it out, see the table, bring it right out. So, I mean, there's a training element involved with it, and you know, it's a learning curve for everybody there, but, um, you know, and the FOGs like me are like, ah, this technology, you know, but we sit there and we teach them because they, have, they all have phones now, and they're texting their grandkids and showing pictures, and we show them this app, and like, oh, this is really cool, I like it, so like, let me show my granddaughter how this works. On our, on our busy days, you know, we have three people behind the counter, and if it's not me or my wife running around doing stuff, you know, we'll have, you know, a college kid who wants to get into the industry, you know, he's on a break, and we teach him, and he runs around, and, you know, we provide the service. I think it's also, Katie, it's all about all about setting up the service model that works well with the, the technology solution that you're using and, and vice versa. What technology solution is going to work well with the service model that you want to deliver? Everything from you don't have to run that food. You might set up a system where they come to the bar. They order at the table and they come and they pick it up or they, they come to pick up food. But um, uh, to the point that was made earlier, if you're doing that, you need to communicate what that is. <laughs> you need to do it early and often and repeatedly and in a lot of places so that the customer doesn't feel that confusion. That's, that's one of the big roadblocks and one of the challenges if you're going to have this hybrid, what I'd call a hybrid service model. Don't be afraid. The other thing is, and listen, this stuff isn't free, right? I, I know that, and, and there's POS people out here today and everything else like that. This stuff costs money. I can tell you that the money that you invest in a good system more than pays for itself in the labor savings and the efficiency and the growth in sales and everything else along those lines. You, you have to spend a little bit in this technology, but, I mean, labor savings, forget about labor savings, just the ability to work with, you can't get that fifth person to work. You have to work with four people. Well, now I've got a system or something in place that allows me or a service model that allows me to work with a lot fewer people. I mean, we, we all know what that labor shortage is like out there. All righty, with that, we're going to stick around for a little bit to answer questions. This is the last session. I know the happy hour starts upstairs in about 30 minutes, and a lot of delicious libations are going to be had. Thank you all for attending a, this uh, event and then showing up in this room. Thank you to this amazing panel. And if you have any questions, we'll stick around for a few more minutes. If not, hopefully catch up with you over a beer soon.